What's an educated mama? Hello, I'm Ryan Jordan, and welcome to The Educated Mama. During this podcast, we will learn from experts, entrepreneurs, creators, and leaders who are also mothers responsible for all the things. Let's celebrate women, learn a few mom hacks, and discuss the beautiful mess of motherhood. We're all learning together, right? Today's guest is Chelsea Mills. Chelsea is the Senior Partner Relations Specialist with HomePay, Household Payroll and Tax Provider. She has been a part of the HomePay team for eight years, and we have been so grateful at Educated Nannies for her support. As Senior Partner Relations Specialist, Chelsea acts as the liaison between agency partners and their clients. Her goal is to educate families hiring for the first time in needing assistance in professionalizing their employer nanny relationship. She provides a seamless experience with the home pay service, and she's also a mom to two sweet little boys. Let's meet our guest. Hi, Chelsea. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, Ryan. Thank you so much for having me. This is so exciting. Absolutely. I'm I'm just grateful you made the time. I know how busy you are with our whole country getting vaccinated at this moment. I feel like a lot of people are opening up to the idea of hiring nannies and have a lot of questions. Yes. So I just wanted to start off first of all, and just can you tell us a little bit about what HomePay is? Yeah, absolutely. So HomePay is a fully comprehensive concierge style payroll and tax service specifically built for families hiring employees in the home. It's been in business since about 1992. Uh, We were previously Breedlove and Associates started by the Breedlove family and then Over time, we have kind of rebranded to be more specific to what we do, which is helping people pay their household employees. Um, And that includes nannies, but also is a broader kind of household employee concept. So senior caregivers, housekeepers, household managers, anyone that's coming in the home, helping families privately, we help them manage their tax, payroll, and labor law compliance. Wonderful. And it's so needed and so necessary because a lot of times, People that call our agency will say questions, you know, have questions for us like, oh, you know, I just want a 1099 my, my, my nanny. They're, they're not there that much. They're just there, you know, like 20 hours a week or, you know, I'm just going to pay cash or under the table. So can you tell us a little bit more about the questions you feel about that and what is a 1099 employee versus a W-2 employee and why are nannies classified? as W-2 employees. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a conversation that we have all the time. A lot of families just are unfamiliar with the process. They don't know what they don't know, right? So when they call in, they think, oh, my nanny would like to just be paid cash, or we just thought we were going to be paying cash. And they assume that that's okay and it's appropriate. But in reality, according to the IRS publication 926, which is the tax guide for household employers, it specifically outlines that household employees are domestic workers. So it means they're subject to minimum wage laws, overtime laws. And as time is going on and this industry is becoming more professionalized, we're seeing a lot more state compliances come in with things like paid sick time, paid leave. um, And even more so now with everything going on in the last year with COVID, unemployment benefits have never been more important than they are now. So we like to go over that information with families and explain that, in fact, these employees are W-2 employees. They need to have taxes withheld from their paycheck. You, as their employer, need to contribute taxes on their behalf, and they need to get a W-2 at the end of the year to file their own personal taxes. It allows the nannies to to bring up employment history, they're receiving those credits to Social Security and Medicare, and then have a safety net in unemployment should they lose their job for any reason, which is especially important now with everything going on. Let's touch upon that, Chelsea. So we have gotten a variety of calls over the last year, and one of the concerns was a family called me and said, I hired a nanny through another agency. I paid cash and Now the nanny got COVID and she tried to file for unemployment, wasn't able to get unemployment and then decided to sue us. So horrible situation for all parties involved. Um, So tell me a little bit more. If I 
have a nanny and they get COVID and, um, or they need to file unemployment, but I'm not paying them, you know, legally, what are my options? What happens then? Yeah, great question. So what happens when a nanny files an unemployment claim, whether it be due to COVID or just losing their job and trying to bridge that gap between the next job, is they submit a request to the state and the state will basically match that up to employer tax returns that should have been filed on that employee's behalf. If those payments and those returns aren't there, a red flag goes up. They say, listen, employee, we don't have any benefits to pay out to you because your employer wasn't contributing. At that time, the family generally gets a notice from the state and the family in theory should go back and file retroactively, which they can do. And it's something that we do all the time for clients. They didn't know, they received this notice, their nanny filed for unemployment. And so they're trying to catch up and do the right thing. So what we do is go back and file those retroactive returns based on wages that they paid, get those benefits paid in. And then at that time, the employee can access those benefits after the fact. Now, the caveat with that is because those tax payments are late, Sometimes we do see penalties and interest, but we generally work with the state to get those reduced, if not waived, just because the family's trying to catch up and do the right thing. They just weren't aware. And that's kind of the process of that when a, an unemployment claim goes to the state and those benefits aren't there. Mm -hmm. And that's such an important information for those who are listening. Yes, this podcast is the Educated Mama, but I am the founder of Educated Nannies and I help educate parents daily. And, you know, there's no judgment. If somebody calls me and they want to learn and they want to receive the information or they want us to share step-by-step -step process, we are always, you know, we have a relationship with HomePay and we're always happy to say, listen, you know, parents get afraid. They'll say, you know, I, oh God, I, I didn't even know that I haven't, I haven't been paying my nanny on payroll. And, and I just say, listen, no judgment when you know, right, you can do right. You know, and, and this is so important. And so tell me a little bit more about the benefits of paying a nanny legally. Why would a family want to be paid legally? And as a nanny, why is it so important to get paid legally? Yeah, absolutely. So I think with this industry. And again, you know, I feel like everything you could talk about today is relevant to this last year and this year and everything that's going on. Um, but this year, especially we've seen a lot of increases in benefits for families, and that would be tax credits available to families. Those have been almost doubled, if not more than doubled this year, that when they file at the end of the year, their personal taxes, they get tax credits for their childcare expenses or they can receive a flexible spending account through their employer if it's a benefit that's sponsored by the family's employer, where they can set aside pre-tax dollars to use towards childcare and they're saving tax money that they would be paying at the end of the year. Um, so benefits like that for the family have been increased this year. Um, on top of the fact that it's a risk, right? So if you have an employee that files an unemployment claim or a wage dispute or heaven forbid, home and gets injured and there's no workers' compensation available, those are all risks that the family runs and you could get audited. So all of those things are, are risks, but the advantages this year have been increased. So tax credits, having that professional relationship with your nanny where you're bringing someone in your home into your kind of family bubble, you want to have an open relationship, open communication, and everything is as seamless as possible. So making sure your nanny is paid professionally is one of the biggest benefits of that relationship. And on the nanny side, as we kind of touched on, the unemployment is there for them should they lose their job. There is paid sick leave. If they do come down with COVID, there's up to 10 days of paid sick leave. It's fully subsidized for the family as well. That's been expanded this year, which is a huge benefit. So neither party has to worry about an employee coming to work sick or risk involved with that. And then we have the social security and Medicare benefits. 
The nanny also has job employment history so that when they go buy a house, buy a car, they can have those pay stubs, that documentation and history to reflect that they have this career, which they do with such an important job and role, they should be paid that way. And so it's been exciting this year to see some of those benefits be increased for families and nannies because I think it's just going to really take the industry to the next level, which has been a long time coming. I absolutely agree. It has been a long time coming. I'm so grateful that nannies are being seen as professionals as they should be. Not only nannies, but also our private educators. So we have a private educator program um, through Educated Nannies. And a lot of people had the same questions about private educators. Tell me a little bit more about how private educators are supposed to be paid. Yeah, that's a great question. and Super relevant to this last year. Um, you know, as you know, we've had conversations about it. A lot of these learning pods and, you know, learning groups have established over the last year for social distancing and trying to find that new normal for kids and private educators generally are going to fall into that same employment bucket unless they have their own business or they have their own tax ID where they're operating kind of as their own See, you know, bubble, they're going to be a private employee because you're bringing them in the home. You're asking them to use the curriculum for your children and the schedule for your children. You're asking them to do what you would like them to help with your children. And it's going to fall into that same category. And that goes back to the 1099 versus W2 conversation of who's directing the work. If the family is directing the work, that's going to be the main differentiator between a 1099 and a W-2 employee, because the W-2 employee is being directed by the family on how they would like the employee to do the work. A 1099 contractor comes in, they know their job, they do it on their own schedule, and then they move on to the next job. And those private educators are really kind of coming into your home, helping you set up that new education process for the families that are involved. And so it falls into that same category of employment. Great. That's wonderful to know. We, we, you know, have paid our nanny through home pay. We pay our private educator through home pay. And we do have a learning pod where we had three families. And what we did is we contacted home pay and said each family has to set up a separate account and whatever the rate is, let's use, you know, any number, say, you know, basic math, $60 an hour for a private educator. Each family pays $20 an hour if you have three families. And each individual family is responsible for the taxes for that person. It works out seamless. It works out well. And I want to know a little bit, you know, people are, people say, you know, how, how hard is it to get set up on this? Or, oh my gosh, is this going to be so time consuming? I'm like, actually, it saves us so much time. So Chelsea, can you give a little insight to that. Like once somebody hires a household employee, what are their responsibilities when they use your service? Yeah, and it's so great that you have firsthand experience with our service because I feel like you can speak to it so well and, and it's so nice to hear. Um, you know, the IRS estimates that for families handling the tax and payroll process on their own, it's about 60 hours a year, which I think any of us with kids and especially hiring someone to come into home and help, we don't have 60 extra hours laying around. I, you know, I barely have 60 minutes laying around in a day. So that's where our service like home pay and, you know, any kind of service like that is going to step in and take over the process for you. And so on the front end, it's about a 20 minute commitment to have a consultation with myself or our team and register with us online. It's very quick and easy. The employee can onboard themselves, which is great. They don't have to hand over personal data right up front if they don't want to, but it goes through the registration process. And then from there, we take everything over. We set up tax accounts. We handle the tax returns on a quarterly basis prepare the year end forms and process payroll. And it's very minimal involvement from the family, which is so nice to hear because as we mentioned, you know, you're know, you hiring someone for a reason to help you and your family and time is not something that's just laying on the table. So it's very minimal time involved for the family, which is great. Wonderful. And let's transition a little bit over to overtime. I know that the domestic rights has passed in certain states. I don't know the number offhand. Is it nine states? Yes. Okay, great. As of right now. 
Okay, and what that basically means is that nannies have to be paid overtime and nannies have to have, you know, benefits of sick pay. I know there's more things included in that if you'd like to elaborate on what the domestic rights mean if you live in a state. What does this mean for you and your family. Yeah, absolutely. So a couple things have come into play, um, you know, specifically for California, they have daily overtime. So anyone who's a personal attendant, which is really going to be anyone spending 80% or more of their time caring for someone has overtime for any hours over nine in a day, and any hours over 40 in a week. Um, for a non-personal attendant, which is going to be more of a household manager, personal assistant role that's going to be over eight hours in a day and 40 hours in a week. Um, that's an example in California of an overtime law. Um, Massachusetts and California and a couple of the other states also have live-in overtime laws. Um, so historically, in, in most states still, if you have a live-in employee, there are no overtime rules. It's just for every hour they work you pay their regular hourly rate. Um, now there's a lot of states that are saying, actually, if they're overtime employee, or excuse me, live in employees, there is overtime that applies for that week. So that's a big thing. Paid sick leave is another one. Um, that's not something that was historically required of domestic employees. And now we have that. Um, in California, for example, an employee earns one hour of sick pay for every 30 hours that they work. Um, and the other states of the nine that we mentioned have a couple of different rules, but it's building into that professional concept, having these benefits of overtime, you know, of course, minimum wage, paid sick leave. It's really important. This is the most important thing about our conversation is that nannies are working the hours, they're getting paid for the hours that they work, and they are getting paid for overtime. So even if that means, you know, because the daily rules in California come into effect, families will call me and say, oh, we need a nanny, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, 12 hour days, that's 36 hours, I don't have to pay overtime. I'm like, oh no, you have to pay three hours of overtime each day because it's over the nine hour threshold if they're a personal attendant. If they're not, then that's actually four hours of overtime per day. So it's important to keep that in mind. Um, and then the next biggest question we get all of the time, especially now since we're opening up a little bit more um, is we're traveling with our nanny. You know, um, this is a tricky conversation. We know nannies sometimes set daily rates. We know nannies sometimes set overnight rates and then we know the law. So it, it's a gray zone. Can you tell me a little bit about what is supposed to happen when nannies travel with families? Sure. Yes, and this is one that we speak to often. So traveling with your nanny, firstly, you should pay for travel and accommodations. Your nanny is not responsible for their flights or any sort of transportation, and they're not responsible for paying for accommodations because you are asking them to come work with you and travel. They should be paid for travel time and any time where they cannot go do something on their own. If they can go take lunch or they can go walk along the beach and they're not on duty, even though they're traveling with you, they don't have to be paid for that time because it's technically their personal time to be used. But if they are on call in any way, if they can't leave the facility, similarly, if they are at your home and they're unable to leave, even if the children are sleeping, you know, if they can't go do something they want to do, that's paid time. Um, if the children are sleeping in the room with the nanny, that's paid time because in theory, they would have to get up with the children. So it will vary by situation, but unless the nanny could go do something that they want to do, that is paid time. Um, and generally we'll see families offer a, a daily stipend for things like meals. Um, they don't have to do that, but it is a nice to have. But at minimum, they need to be paid that time that they're on call and that travel time and have accommodations and lodging all set by the family. Great. Now, what about if I want to have a date night with my husband and we want to hire a babysitter? Do I have to pay the babysitter on payroll? Great question. So it's tricky 
because if you look at unemployment thresholds, um, there's kind of two thresholds we look at. There's a social security and Medicare threshold that says if you pay one person more than $2,300 in the year, you need to report those wages for social security and Medicare purposes. And that's per person that you would in theory have working for you. Unemployment is a little bit trickier. So in California, if you pay any of employees, $750 or more in a calendar quarter, you need to report all employees for that calendar year and the next calendar year. So that would include your casual babysitter because you're crossing that threshold. Let's say you have a nanny for work week hours and then a casual babysitter for after hours that would cross into that threshold and you should be reporting them. Okay, so let me just clarify for a minute. So if I have a babysitter that comes in the state of California and she makes $800, I've hit the threshold, I have to payroll the babysitter. But then anyone else I have come after that for the next whole calendar year, I also have to payroll that person. What if they just come once on a Saturday night? Technically, you would payroll all of them in that calendar year and the following, even if it's very sporadic, once a quarter, once a year. Um, yeah, that it's it's a little strict, you know, when you look at a lot of families have that casual babysitter coming, um, but it is kind of once you turn that switch on, that switch is on for that year and the next year. Interesting. That's good information to know. I'll be honest, I did not even know that. Um, not that I have had a babysitter in my home because we stick with the people we have who are on payroll, but it's good to be mindful of it for the next year about how we incorporate, you know, you might want to just end up paying your regular nanny overtime than having to, uh, you know, incur more fees with a separate person and have a lot more, you know, W-2s that you're having to give out. So as parents, you know, we think about all of those things. How can we set ourselves up for success and do everything legally, but also make sure that we're mindful of the costs that we're incurring? So that's the next question. So many families say to me, well, how much does a payroll service cost a month or a year? And, and how much taxes are we looking at? So I get that question a lot. So what would you say to that? Yeah, great question. So in general, we say a safe estimate is, let's take a weekly amount just for easy numbers, $500 a week is what you're looking to offer in any gross pay. Add on a 10% premium for payroll and tax, for payroll and taxes. So that 10% is gonna be social security, Medicare, unemployment, and any small state tax like California has a disability tax. So really that $550 per week, the family should budget for taxes. And then if you throw in a service like HomePay, uh, we're $75 per month with a $100 year end fee. So about an extra $900 annually. Um, so it's safe to say that 10 to 11% on top of the nanny's wages is what you wanna budget for that extra compliance and tax piece. Okay. Is there anything else I'm forgetting, Chelsea, that you think is really important that our listeners should know? I think that this conversation has covered a lot of things that I speak to families about all the time. Um, you know, if any questions come up, and I want to go back to your point of families feeling nervous or insecure about the fact that they didn't know any of this or they weren't paying their name legally. Um, you know, I think it's a great thing to get fixed. If you haven't been doing it, let's get it fixed moving forward. If you want to fix it on the back end, we can do that. Um, you know, I always say something is better than nothing. So I at least ha love having those conversations where families are aware of their, their requirements, nannies are aware of what they should be receiving and how they should be professionally paid. And just having those conversations, because I think it really helps provide a quality relationship and it helps spread the word about kind of what these requirements are. And like we said, a lot of people just don't know, they're not familiar, they're hiring for the first time. So education is key um, and that's what we're here for, you know, whether they want to use our service or not. I just really love speaking to families about those requirements and how to best take that next step. And I think that's just super important to at least be open to having that conversation. I agree. That's one of the things I do daily is we obviously offer your service and provide your service and tell all of our clients about the free consultation. And I always say, you know, even 
if you don't decide to use our services or home pay services, at least you're equipped with the information to make an empowered choice. And you can feel good about the choices that you're making in the future by having that information. I tell parents all the time, gather all of that information and then make the best educated choice for your family. And again, when you know better, you do better. So it's just, you know, I genuinely think people want to be good and follow these rules and you know nannies as well there's a lot of times families will come to me and say I really wanted to hire this nanny but she or he wanted to be paid cash or they wanted to be paid cash so I think it's just really important to have all of that information and what I can tell you is this is that you know I've been I was paid um, as a nanny from home pay and then I became a mom boss and I do have you know household employees um, in my home and once you hit those thresholds it's really important to honor that person and to pay the taxes and to treat them as a professional just like any other job with any other industry and um, Chelsea is always available I connect her with our clients and she does a really great job of getting back to them. She's always, the whole team over there has always been really mindful and kind and giving good directions. So I really appreciate your time, Chelsea. Do you have any last thoughts or anything that you want to share before we go? You know, I did just think of something that's been a hot topic that I think might be relevant to some of your clients and listeners. Um, and that is, a question I've gotten pretty frequently recently is, can I pay my employee through my business payroll? And I've had it a lot over the years, but more recently it's come up. And the question is no, um, you know, it's technically illegal. And the reason for that is that businesses can take tax breaks on their employee and payroll costs. But that employee that they're taking a tax break on has to be directly contributing to the success or profit loss of that business. And while we think of nannies as being a direct contributor in the thought that they're helping us so we can do our job, they're not directly working for that business. So that tax break that, uh, that would be taken on that payroll is not correct. It's not appropriate. As well, I've had the question, well, if I do pay her through my business, then I can just put her on my benefits through my company. Well, if she gets injured or sick and files a claim, we've seen that some health insurance companies are going to reject that claim because they see that she's not a true employee of the business. And so now we have an employee who has no coverage for health insurance. And we've got issues because basically you have an, an illegal employee on your payroll because they're not a part of the business. So I do think that is one thing that a lot of people aren't aware of. Um, and they think that it's, it's doing the right thing. You know, it's not that people don't aren't trying to do the right thing. They just don't know that that's not appropriate. And it's ultimately viewed as tax evasion or health insurance fraud. Um, so I did just think that that would be an important one to bring up too. I think that's really important. I get that question all the time. And I say, chat with your accountant, chat with home pay. <laughs> Even me, they're like, oh, well, you can just put your nanny on undereducated nannies. I'm like, no, I can't. I have office employees under educated nannies and I have a separate, you know, employer identification number for my household employees. It's not an option. Even if my name is called educated nannies, that's not an option. So. You know, I appreciate you bringing that up because we do get that question. So thank you so much for your time, Chelsea. And um, hopefully we'll be in touch. I know just this week, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we'll have something to catch up on this week. And I really appreciate you bringing me on. And um, this is fun and exciting. And, and thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening today. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode and you had some great aha moments. I am so passionate about empowering women and I can't thank you enough for your support. If you know an inspiring mama or you are an inspiring mama, send them our way. Be sure to tune in every Wednesday and please like, follow, and subscribe to The Educated Mama. Write a review, leave us a comment, share this podcast with your friends. I'm Ryan Jordan, founder and CEO of Educated Nannies. You got this, mama. <laughs>